welcome this, to this talk. Uh, my name is Miriam Palosari Elandhari, um, and I work uh, in Stockholm at Södertörn University uh, most days. Um, other days uh, I do my own artwork and uh, board games and other small uh, experimental games. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is one of these games. Uh, uh, it's a game, it's a board game um, that is about approaching uh, life issues that are complex and that can be difficult. Um, and while working on this, I have been thinking about ways uh, to use board game mechanics um, as um, like a vehicle for creating safe spaces for talking about deep things, but doing it in a constructive manner. Um, my background is uh, that I used to work as a programmer back in the like late uh, 90s in the games industry, and then I went into research, and I have been working a lot with uh, like AI and gameplay, <coughs> AI-driven gameplay, and um, lots of work in synthetic humans. Um, so I've been looking a lot of like what constitutes a human, how do you build a human, <laughs> and how do humans uh, how do you simulate um, conversations um, and uh, related things? But lately, I have been starting to look much more at board game mechanics and what kind of what those situations can afford us. So, like the tabletop situation is really special because we have the situation where people sit together, often in their homes. Um, and they approach things in a really playful manner. And it's very focused. You don't use your cell phones. You're not distracted. You're not doing uh, lots of other stuff. Um, so it's kind of a perfect situation for really deconstructing things that are important to you. Um, so I have been working with this game that has the title Mind Shadows. Um, and the aim with the game design is to create these kinds of situations uh, where you can help each other to understand more difficult life problems. Um, so, talking about games for therapy, um, it's, it's like there are lots of people who have been doing work on how you can use it. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, so that's going to be like the first part of this talk. Then I'm going to just show you a little bit about the, 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 the board game uh, that I made, which is free for download as a printable. Um, but then I'm going to tell you about what I learned <coughs> from this as a design case. Like how can you, uh, how can you design uh, games uh, that affords really safe spaces uh, for people to have conversations in? Um, and one thing which was really interesting in this design was to see like how a gamist approach, when you look at board gaming as a game of number, uh, how this can work towards really starting to understand situations and how players, when they play, tend to leave the kind of gamist approach and go over to a more kind of narrative approach uh, where they want to have malleable rules to be able to change the rules as they play. Um, another th important lesson from designing this game was that it became so uh, obvious that you really need to think consciously about how you game master in these situations. Uh, like, like, how can you really kind of create this uh, safe space when you do that? There has to be a method uh, for doing this. So that is also something that I will be talking a bit about. Um, so, like, previous research shows that you can't really come to any super conclusive result saying that okay, games are great for therapy. It's not obviously not that simple, because there are so many other factors in play. It's really difficult to isolate what things affects another in a type of situation like that. And also, when it comes to actual therapy, uh, the relationship with uh, 
uh, with a therapist is so important. So in this case, for this game, it's not intended like for therapy in a clinical setting, but rather for like constructive conversations between friends and family members, often people who know each other fairly well, uh, or who want to learn to each other better, learn to know each other better. Um, so, however, what you can say uh, is that the actual gaming situation does create this type of space that there is conclusive proof of. Uh, so, so, I've, so that's something that I've kind of been doing. Something which is quite common uh, to use as a structure uh, in, in, in therapy games and other uh, settings is the notion of psychodrama. Uh, and this is uh, a type of uh, uh, play where, where you start, uh, usually you have a psychodrama playing out like in a theater manner uh, in three phases. You have a warm-up uh, to kind of get into the mood of, of playing this. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and then you go on to the actual play, and then the very important thing uh, is to uh, like have an integration phase. And this is very close to the way people usually play uh, uh, board games. Like, you have the setup phase. You sit together and you put out all the pieces. Uh, you, you touch them, you move them around, and you kind of get into the mood of playing, and you nibble on your snacks and what have you. Um, and then you do the actual play, and then usually the integration, if you would kind of compare it uh, to a psychodrama, is when you start counting. You determine who won, you talk about how the gameplay session was. Uh, if you would um, like compare it to LARPing, there is always like when you do live action role play, uh, you have like a very important phase in the end when you talk about what really happened so that you process uh, what is happening. So it's kind of like. Uh, is already in the structure uh, of how to do this. And I'm using this uh, structure for, uh, for the board game uh, that I'm going to show you a little bit from, uh, which is called um, uh, Mind Shadows. I'm not really sure it's, that's going to be the final title. It is that right now. So what you do uh, in the beginning of the game um, is that you set up the emotional state of those who are playing. Uh, another thing is that you give each other superpowers, uh, which is based on how, you, how well you know each other. Um, and you also define the, cha the challenge in the game. So this is all kind of player created. Uh, when you play, uh, there is like a fixed number of turns. You have a storyteller uh, telling a short little story, like framing it. Uh, you have the shadow. Uh, I'm going to tell you more about that later. Um, who does destructive actions towards the players, and then when it's the player's turn, they can support each other and find ways to deal with how the shadow works. Um, so, and the way to win the game uh, is to make the shadow, which is represent a real-world problem, uh, is to make this shadow insignificant. Uh, so it's not important. Learn how to cope with it. Um, and in the reflection phase, this is basically leafing through uh, piles of cards that has been played in a certain order and see what parts of the game uh, you want to uh, keep for future sessions. So it's a kind of like a little bit of a deck building game. Um, so like this is like the, in, in the setup phase, uh, players start out with uh, putting they have um, tokens for emotions and uh, tokens for emotional uh, resistance and energy. So ve very kind of cl classic uh, types of, um, uh, of values uh, for, for this play. Um, so fiddle around with these, with these little tokens. Um, and uh, also uh, at this point, leafing through uh, superpowers. So, Usually, uh, you know each other well. If you don't, you just put them out randomly. Like, um, if I, like, my friend Jenny over there, I mean, I would give you, like, the, uh, the superpower of being able to protect people. Um, and then you would use that as your superpower in play. 
Um, and you also get a hand of random support cards that you use in play. Uh, and this is kind of what, what, they, what they look like at various stages of prototyping. Uh, this is the board uh, of, uh, of the shadow. So here, uh, players can either uh, pick a pre-made shadow or make a shadow of their own. Uh, the most interesting is when people do a shadow of their own, uh, but if people don't know each other, it, it can be kind of less, uh, less um, sensitive if you take a um, pre-made one. And what happens here is, like, if, if a shadow represents, for example, pain, all players take their uh, uh, pain token away from their own uh, boards. So instead, during this session, they are dealing with a shared pool of pain. Um, or it can be guilt or some kind of negative emotion that you need to deal with together. So um, this is what uh, the shadow card looks like when you write on it yourself. Um, and uh, a pre-made uh, shadow that exists is, for example, one that represents guilt, uh, like the, re the uh, neglected relative. Um, so, in, in the neglected relative card, um, you have... Um, th and this is mined from play sessions, like lots of people associate guilt with grandmothers and, and people who they don't have time to give enough uh, time and, and appreciation. So, when it is the shadow's turn, uh, someone has to, like, represent the shadow. Uh, and in this case, if I roll uh, my die, a six-sided die, um, depending on what, what number comes up. So if I would roll a one for the shadow, um, it would say, I don't want to be a burden, but... And the person who is targeted uh, gains a little bit of... Uh, loses some resistance. If it's number two, um, the shadow says, uh, of course you don't have time for me. It's, it's all about priorities. I understand. And, and your guilt, of course, increases there. Um, and then uh, you can have like a guilt tripping or also looking at what the worst thing that it could do. So this is... And also there's some randomness, like if it's a five or a six, uh, then you pick uh, cards from, from different types of piles that gives you uh, sort of... So it gives a little bit of variety, but it's still like either player-defined or, or not. So, uh, and you'd think that it would be really hard for players to do this, to, to write these cards, but it turns out that they, uh, it only takes about five minutes, and people do this in conversation and kind of also find common problems. Sometimes players uh, form a, a common uh, shadow uh, of something that they feel that they need to talk about. Uh, when it's the player's turn, uh, they can counter the actions of, of the player. And here, uh, the gameplay is created so that you can only help each other. You cannot hurt... Uh, you, you can dimin only diminish guilt. Uh, there is absolutely no possibility in, in the game, rule-wise, to do destructive actions, uh, which kind of sim like simplifies it uh, a bit, because, well... It, there can be difficult situations here. So, the first thing uh, is that um, players usually have, uh, have roles. One will be the storyteller. Uh, so, the storyteller gives a little bit of a framing for what is happening. Like, for example, you, you, can't, you don't have time to go to your grandmother's um, uh, birthday. Uh, that, that could be a kind of situation that you might want to have here. And, and think about it from, like, from the top of their heads. So, uh, then uh, it's the shadow's turn, one player rolls for that, uh, and then uh, players do support actions. And that's also the case that you only have five of these, which are pre-written, but you also have two blank cards. Uh, so, if there's only kind of comp things that doesn't seem to fit the situation, you write your own support card. Uh, like, for example, you say, okay, you can't make it to your grandmother's uh, birthday, but hey, I suggest that you send her flowers. 
Um, and, and that could be kind of like one suggestion. Um, so, and this uh, goes on, and you can win in two ways. So there's two strategies. Um, and uh, one is to uh, make the uh, shadow uh, less significant, and that is when it completely, it loses its energy. The other one is to diminish the amount of guilt. And so, so, so depending on what kind of strategy players do, um, well, they, they win either way. Sometimes they don't win, but that's quite rare. <coughs> so, and in the end, uh, there's a kind of pile of cards uh, created, like uh, stacking up. It's to leaf through the card and see, like, did someone come with a suggestion that was so good that it should go into the main deck? Uh, like, for example, to send flowers. Maybe you would want to have, have that as part of, uh, part of your deck when you play the next time. Which means that when people start building up their decks, uh, they have uh, support actions that their family and friends have made that they can use for other families and friends. And they can say, hey, my brother uh, made this card. I think it, that would actually suit you here in this situation too. So there is a kind of like uh, a build-up of, of tools for, for how to suggest how you can go about solving kind of real-life problems. So, things that happen here in play uh, is that since, since the shadow uh, targets all players, is that you start to gain an understanding about how the other person feels about the situation. Uh, because I'm suddenly targeted uh, by my friend's uh, shadow. And then I really start to understand what is happening. Um, so there is a kind of like a change of perspective going on. Um, the other thing is also that you start to understand your own shadows as you play. Uh, you, 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 you're getting other people's perspective on them. And you have also kind of bro broken down uh, a situation into a structure. Another thing is that in, in when you get these cards, I might uh, believe that my friend would feel really good if I did something. Uh, or I can specify that now I do this, you should feel like this. Uh, and that is, might not be at all how the person feels that gets that card, which also highlights that you might not react in the way that we perceive that we're supposed to act and feel. And that is something that becomes evident here, uh, that you might not see otherwise. Um, the other thing is that there, the, the things that take most time is when people start really discussing, like, what would happen if we did like this together? Or how about we did this? Uh, and, those, uh, and, and those things, Sometimes they take a long time, so it's hard to say exactly how long a, a game session takes, uh, but usually the, uh, one session takes about 20 minutes. Um, so a little note about the production uh, process here is that it builds on a previous project that I did that was very heavily kind of AI focused, um, but uh, it was a kind of an MMO prototype using kind of synthetic humans, but people could uh, define their own boss monsters. And this was a really powerful feature. So, like, I was going to isolate this feature and make it into one small digital game, but then I needed to paper prototype it, so I did. And I realized that, oh my god, it functions as a board game. Uh, and how far can I go without using any kind of computational processing, but all I have is the randomness of six and the stack of cards, and which turned out to be a super interesting kind of like just game design experiment to see how far you can go. Um, and also making a non-digital game is a good thing because uh, since, since I work uh, as a lecturer, I don't have time to sit and, and you know, be a <coughs> one-woman production studio. Uh, so then board gaming is, is kind of a good thing. Um, the two most interesting design things um, that came out 
was this uh, the the first one is about like bleed when you have things going from b between uh, real life and a kind of game situation. Uh, the other one was how obvious uh, it was uh, that people had so different approaches uh, to towards play. Uh, I could see that. Uh, in some sessions, players really needed to change the rules in order to make uh, the game work for them. Uh, so it was really kind of important to, like I, I realized that in, I'm going to kind of, it's possible to play it in two ways, in a game mist way and in a narrative way. Um, and in the narrative way, instead of me saying like, I'm now giving you a compliment, you should feel confidence. Uh, I say, uh, you look fantastic today. How does that make you feel? Uh, and then the person who received this compliment can say, uh, well, it makes me feel like this, and move the, mark the emotion markers according to that instead of the game rules. Um, and it's for I, I managed to formulate the rules so that you still have the same kind of win criteria uh, to, uh, against the shadow like game mechanics wise, so, so that the se a session still takes approximately the same time, uh, which I felt was, I was really happy about that design change. Um, the other uh, interesting thing is the notion of the bleed between these situations. And this is a concept that has been uh, like talked about in uh, role-playing circles for, for, for a few years. And it's about how, uh, how real life bleeds into uh, play and the other way around. Uh, depending on what way you, you want to play, sometimes uh, you want to keep these things really separate. Um, however, uh, the way I designed this game was that bleed would be the central issue of the, of the design. Um, so that uh, so that is part of it. The thing is, though, that when you do this, when you work with these uh, things, when you have this bleed, it's really, really important to make sure uh, that you frame it. Because if you trust each other in, in this gameplay, it, it can become quite, quite sensitive. It's really, uh, it's really critical. Uh, because it's like because sometimes in some sessions things have come up that people need to be really prepared to embrace to uh, to be able to talk about in a way that is not flippant or um, or so. So I've been looking at ways to create uh, safe spaces. Um, and uh, I'm looking at it from two angles. Uh, one is, how do you create the rules of the game in order to create a safe space? And um, I don't know, how, how many of you went to Christodina's talk just now? Yeah. Yes, and there you are. So you were talking about this uh, notion of the paramount reality. Um, and this is really something uh, which resonates with the way that I'm thinking about this design. Because, uh, like, depending on how you approach uh, the reality uh, and the world that you build by just making a simple rule system, it has a huge impact. Like, for example, what kind of human responses are you working with in the design? Uh, many games use the fight or flight tendency, or so that you either you flee or you fight or you do that. But that is not the only human response to challenge. Uh, there is also evidence showing like when we are under challenge, what we do is that we start tending and befriending each other. We don't have to make only games about fight and flight. We can use this mechanics as well. It's just as a viable response uh, to being under threat. Um, the other thing is to see in the main gameplay, what actual rules do you use uh, when you build a world? Um, like, what is the win criteria? Do you win 
uh, by competing, like are you trying to capture the flag? Uh, is it uh, to run the fastest? Uh, or to gather as many things uh, as you can from a finite set of resources? Um, or uh, do you do it in a cooperative way? This, again, is like very broadly something to really think about when you cr are creating these types of games. Um, another thing is looking at the affordances uh, that you give to the players, like what actions can players perform uh, through their representation, if they have one. Um, and in, in, in the case of Mind Shadows, the affordances given to the players is that they can, they can help each other, they can hug each other, they can create supportive actions for each other. Um, and that's it, that's what they can do. Uh, they cannot really hurt each other. Uh, like game mechanic wise, of course. I mean, you can always hurt someone if you want to, but, um, but not here. <laughs> Uh, so those are kind of the things, so this is what I propose as, as like the three main uh, ways to create safe spaces, game design-wise, um, when creating these types of games. Uh, looking at uh, the affordances of actions, uh, looking at uh, the main gameplay, and also what type of metaphors for human responses to challenge that you use, because there will always be challenge in a game there will, in most cases, be some sort of win criteria. The other part, which I feel that I really need to work more on, uh, is on how to frame this play. So, uh, a future plan is to work more with clinical therapists um, and people who have long experience in game mastering. Uh, to see, like, is it possible to like, find patterns of how you can do this? Um, to have uh, constructive conversations. Um, and this is also kind of like, how can you encompass, in, instead of doing this kind of separation, like now I'm thinking like for therapy games, uh, to use the bleed effect uh, in, a, in a way that works well. Um, and, and thirdly, also have... Uh, Make it possible to uh, change rules of the game as you play. Like having uh, these type of malleable rule sets uh, where, you can, where, where you can do that. And this is something which is kind of like part of my future plan, like to make a single player version of this, uh, but so that you, you can reflect upon problems, but having uh, a kind of AI component that can afford changeable rules within, within the game in, in certain sessions. Mm. So, that is kind of, that is what I had to say about building safe spaces. So, um, in the future, uh, what I will do is basically like take take the game uh, as it is now and make a boxed version uh, and but but make sure that I have more instructions for game mastering um, uh, the game because I feel like now it's out there as a printable and and that's good but I, I still have this kind of like lingering worry that that people m might just use it just too offhandedly and 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 that like. I think it's perfectly fine, but but still. Um, then I'm also something uh, which I'm about to do is to make a version that you can wear as a necklace, uh, so that you'd have it like around your neck, and you had two bracelets, so that if if you meet your best friend and she has had a like a horrible day at work, and you're you're going out for a beer. And you just say like, okay, look, hey, take take this bracelet, and I'm I'm taking this other one. That's your emotional state, and I'm taking my my necklace off and putting it like uh, between our glasses, and and we just play for 15 minutes, like breaking down the situation uh, to see 
and you know, and make it really simple. Maybe have a little deck of cards uh, to help you to do that. And 15 minutes later, maybe you have gotten it out of your system. Maybe you've had a laugh about the complete absurdity uh, of whatever situation uh, that that you're facing. Um, if someone would like to play it, it's uh, uh, you don't need much. Um, you need a six-sided die. Um, 28 pieces of A4 paper, uh, and the printer, and the friend, and scissors, so that you can cut up the cards. And that is it. If you want to read a little bit more about it, there, um, there is a paper I wrote about basically this and this, the framing of safe spaces, um, which should be in the DIGRA library by now. And uh, that was that was kind of that was it. So if you have any questions uh, I'm just wondering uh, maybe you've already said this, but are you making it on your spare time for free? Are you well, you're giving yes. this away, but are you planning to give it away for free? Or Well, I was thinking like the, the boxed version I obviously can't give out for free because it's going to cost something to make it. Uh, so what I was going to do was like make it in a kind of print-on-demand uh, thing through Game Crafter or something uh, so, so that you could kind of put it out there. Um, but I, or I don't know, or maybe do a Kickstarter or something. I, I have no, I, I don't, I, like... And, and the time you put in making this, have you done this on your spare time, or have you been funded, or like...? Well, I have done it on my spare time and non-funded, because this type of work, I have been trying to make it part of, like, my research agenda for a long time, and I have been able to do that, like, for some parts. Um, and I have been talking to companies who actually would like to, uh, you know, work on it. Uh, but this is kind of like really my pet project. I don't want anyone to tell me how this is supposed to be. I want to know, do it ex completely on my own together with my players and like have it as that. Then, if I do a digital version of it, then obviously it won't work like that because I will need the different types of resources. Uh, but like for this this particular part, I'm just kind of thinking like if there is anything that I would want to give away, it's this. Like I'm, I can you know charge for you know other things, and I do, <laughs> but not this. Uh. I was just wondering, um, would the game better be played with people who don't know each other? I mean, if it is played with friends sometime, you don't want to let your friend know some of your secrets, or you don't want to give a lot of superpowers to one friend and the other one finds that you didn't give him anything. I don't know, would it cause some problems if it is played with friends, that you don't really need them? I hear I don't you. know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. with foreigners, maybe you will, you will. You are all coming to sort of to to solve your issues, but you don't have this burden of. Uh, I don't really maybe want to open up to even to a relative or something. You this is my question. Actually, thank you for that question. That that's something I kind of like. Uh, that's something I haven't... In a therapy situation, that is what you would have, because then you would really have uh, like a very confidential situation. Uh, and so that would be a case where, where you would play it like that. But of course, I mean, the game is, is out there, it's downloadable. Of course, people can play it without knowing each other. Um, but I, ha I haven't done that. I have never played this with someone that I don't know. Uh, so that it would be really interesting if someone does play it with someone who they don't know and see how what that feels like because yes, some things you really don't want to share 
I kind of like once made a mistake of, it wasn't a mistake, it was quite interesting, but I played it with my father and we talked about like old conflict from my teens. That was like, oh, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> but that, that was like, and in, in, other, uh, in, in other ways, well, yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, I just have a question. You mentioned a few times that you were interested in giving better instructions or more instructions to the game master yeah. sort of experience, which suggests to me that you're nervous about <laughs> something or that what is it? I'm just curious to know, like, what is it that you think is missing or that you're afraid might take a wrong track or why? What are the kinds of instructions? It, that you it's, about? it's it's like I. Can also, this is, these things are really necessary to verbalize too, because uh, what I can see is that if, if you're, for example, sitting in a pub uh, with people that you might know or not know, that, that creates a certain type of, of, of situation. Like if you're, I think it's, it's more about like giving really practical instructions, like play it at home, play it like when you're like in a frame where you can meet each other and also giving instruction on how to meet each other, what kind of like to take the time. What I'm afraid of is that uh, someone says something that is very sensitive and the other person that they play with doesn't receive it in that manner and might belittle it or, or might like make it like not value uh, that someone shares something important with you. I think that is what I'm afraid of. Like that someone would be feeling like going away from a play session, feeling vulnerable instead of feeling strengthened. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for a nice talk, and I'm, I'm certainly interested to try the game. Uh, I was thinking, since you did mention that you were interested in maybe consulting with uh, mental health professionals, yes. do you have anything like do you have anything special in mind that you're interested in getting feedback on, or just the game in general, seeing as it is about therapy? Uh, so, so this game in particular is like for a social situation for friends. So, but I, what I in particular would want to uh, is to talk with uh, people who are uh, working with kind of uh, gestalt therapy when you're using kind of like dollhouse plays and representations and kind of like building up problems with, world, with worlds there and make that into its own variety but making sure that it's something uh, that therapists can use as a tool in their practice. So that is kind of what I'm interested in doing. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, as a D&D &D enthusiast and also as a person with uh, ADHD and Asperger's, um, I personally have struggled a bit with my own uh, diagnosis. And for me, I kind of see this game as not only as a great tool to help overcome mental difficulties and obstacles, but also to get that uh, kind of shared experience of what it is like to go through uh, difficulty from someone else's perspective um, as not only just mental um, experiences, but also like um, what it's like to be part of a minority or what it's uh, like to be outside of the norm and etc. Do you have like any plans or ideas on maybe creating a specific uh, set or expansion dealing with those kinds of things? Uh, uh, yes, thank you for, for that and thank you for, uh, for sharing that because this is like so when you play this 
getting aware of what emotion responds to you and also say that I actually didn't respond in that way is like good for everyone who has even the slightest like I mean we're, we're, we're all there somehow um, but yes I do have several kind of some like sets of rules in plan for this uh, like for example um, like when Gamergate happened for example I was trying to make one kind of small uh, subset of certain shadows and certain ways of, of how to deal with this. Uh, the same goes for like recognizing emotions, what exactly kind of like what is happening uh, when you're moving these pieces around and where do you need to change those pieces, like having these changeable rules. And also kind of like having different types of context because uh, like it's very different rules in place depending on its gamer gate or if it's for example bullying at work when you can quite early sometimes see tendencies uh, that someone is, is getting pushed out from a workplace if you can do something about that early when you see those signals and and kind of like simulate these kinds of processes i think it could be possible to actually mitigate at least some of those things so, yes, I just wish I had, you know, more time to do this. Like, I could do this all the time, but, but you know, I do it like, oh, it's 11 o'clock, I'm not dead yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. More questions? Otherwise, thank you so much for, for coming, for listening to me, and for the questions. <laughs>